February is Black History Month, which gives everybody a chance to take in some new history and appreciate the influence that black culture has had on greater popular culture basically through every time period on the face of this planet. And there is no phenomenon that is an exception to that, and especially that is the case for mixology. So today we're going to take a look at one of, if not the most important historical mixologists ever, and one who was proudly African American. This is John Dabney and his Hailstorm Mint Julep on Mike's Hard Reviews. Hey there, hi there, ho there, my name is Michael and welcome back to Mike's Hard Reviews. I'm a former bartender from the Kalamazoo, Michigan area, and today we're starting off our observance of Black History Month by talking about who may be the oldest African American influence in mixology culture, at, l at least that I am aware of at this time, at least in America for that matter. John Dabney has a really, really long and complex history that has been very fortunately legacied very, very well. And there's a lot to go over, so I'm gonna do this in two different segments. The first segment is going to be everything about his catering and restaurateurship, his mixology influences, his overall, the general structure of his life. We'll make the cocktail that he became famous for, the Hailstorm Mint Julep. And then we'll jump back into his history and talk about some of the more oddball stories and the caveats that existed uh, in his existence. So John Dabney was born in 1824 outside of Richmond, Virginia to a mother who was a maid and cook and a father who was a carriage driver. Unfortunately, um, like many people who were black and born in the 1800s prior to the Civil War, John Dabney was born into slavery and as a young man, was sent to work as a caddy, uh, yes, a yeah, horse caddy, um, by his enslaver. Now, sometime after that, into Dabney's teens, uh, his enslaver gets married and dies shortly after, leaving that enslaver's widow with no active income, meaning that she has to find a way to support herself, and she does that by selling out Dabney's efforts to her brother, who puts him to work at a restaurant outside of Gordonsville, Virginia. While there, Dabney picks up on the restaurant sort of ethos and work ethic like that. It's, he's a natural at it. And within the next two years or so, I think it is, by the age of 18, he has established himself as a prominent part of that restaurant's culture and has taken the position of head waiter, which is a big deal for his age and his you know amount of experience, but also because he was an African-American slave. And that's not something you hear about often in the South, especially, and especially Virginia at the time. Uh, after working with um, his enslaver's wife's brother, rather on the behest of uh, his enslaver's wife's brother, um, Dabney moves to downtown Richmond and starts work at the Columbian Hotel in the late 1840s, early 1850s. And he's there for about two years before he has become a minor celebrity in the area. Around this time, there are the first sort of written accounts of what Dabney was doing with food and hospitality services. And people begin to write about this incredible drink that he makes called a Hailstorm Julep. Uh, I, there, there's a, there are four major Richmond newspapers at this time. One of them releases uh, a review of it, and uh, to sort of paraphrase, they say, uh, it, it was a mint julep, a drink that I, like, I've never had before in my life. Um, and having had one, I firmly, firmly agree. Dabney becomes, you know, mildly famous and in the Colombian, he's taking to this very, very well. He's wowing people with his, his drink craft and his hospitality skills. And eventually he moves on to the, uh, I believe it's the State House and Exchange Hotel uh, in 1855, 1852. Um, at that point, he's taking over for the previous chef who was working off of a 19th century, like French haute cuisine um, menu. And he masters it almost immediately. Prior to his arrival, the hotel was already known as a prominent spot for like Richmond culture, one of the best restaurants in the entire city, if not the entire United States, or at least they would have claimed so. And Dabney takes it and runs with it and does a really good job further cementing himself as a prominent restaurateur at the time. So Dabney becomes this famous restaurateur, caterer, mixologist, bartender, 
in both of these two previous hotel engagements. And eventually, even slightly prior to the Civil War, begins to open up his own restaurants. The first of which is Senate House, which is opened in 1862, and the next one being Dabney House uh, Restaurant, which opened in 1865. I could not find records as to whether or not either of those restaurants are still standing and open either for service or as historical sites, but they were in their time hallmarked as two absolutely outstanding restaurants that were very much worth the time of the people in Richmond. Dabney continues his work as a restaurateur, caterer, and mixologist, um, serving drinks and being one of the key features of that culture in Richmond, essentially until the week that he dies, where just before he turns 75, he dies at home in bed of kidney failure, likely brought on by his extreme work ethic because the man truthfully was a workaholic. He put his all into everything to prove himself. And while it may have led to sort of his unfortunate health, you know, declines at the end of his life, he had a lot to show for it in the end. And one of those things he had to show was the Hailstorm Mint Julep, which we are going to make and talk about more specifically right now. So John Dabney's namesake is called the Hailstorm Mint Julep. And there's a reason it's called that, but the primary one is his new and heavy utilization of this mystical new invention called ice. <laughs> it's difficult to think about in modern days, but back in the 1800s and even the early 1900s, ice was not easy to come by. Typically ice had to be harvested, like bound naturally, harvested and then shipped on large barges to different places around the world. The further it had to be shipped, the more expensive it was, and it was already dangerous and life-threatening work. But as ice became more and more prevalent, easier to get, and for rich people, affordable, it got used in a lot of different applications, including things like ice cream, uh, frozen ice treats, and the mint julep. What Dabney did that no one else did was embrace the impact that ice could have on mixology to its fullest, beyond any other extent or measure that anyone else had dreamt of at that point. And that is what makes a hailstorm so special. It is the most refreshing, beautiful, and yet still simple and palate-friendly thing I have ever tasted in my entire life. And today, we're gonna make one, and I'm gonna make it now, because I'm really, I really fucking want one. <laughs> so um, Dabney would actually shave the ice himself when he would make these using a carpenter's plane uh, and take just all, all of the shavings that that would produce when he, like he's cutting down his own ice to using cocktails. And if you would ever thought about how big one of these blocks is, it could be as big as the top of a table or like a large plank of wood, essentially, just made of ice. It's a lot of ice and the, the thing that needs to be stated is before you even start making this, you have to have at the very least a lot of crushed or shaved ice on hand or very small pebble ice that you can pour this over or else it's, it's, it's not gonna have the same, the same vibe, the same motif about it. Once you've got that part settled away, because it is the cornerstone of the drink, we can talk about the ingredients, which you can see here in front of you. Like a lot of older, um, very, very, very you know, classic cocktails. It doesn't use a syrup. The Hailstorm does not use a syrup. It uses uh, regular raw sugar. Uh, and in this case, it's actually a super fine sugar, which is a granulated sugar that is ground down to almost powder and is easy to use in drinks because it dissolves very quickly. I couldn't find it. And the next best thing that I could think of was a raw sugar or a, dem a demerara sugar um, because it's got more character to it. And it will complement our base spirit, which in this case is rum, uh, very, very well. Even in the context of it's not super fine, it won't dissolve super fast, it doesn't need to because we're gonna be muddling this at various parts and it'll break down well enough to sweeten the drink appropriately. We're also going to need uh, some water to help establish the julep base, um, a good rum of some kind, um, and Dabney's original recipe called for a couple different things. The original recipe actually uh, includes the options, like explicitly states the options of a peach eau de vie, which is a brandy made from peaches, like distilled from peaches, um, an apple brandy, same thing, but with apples, uh, regular brandy or cognac, uh, I, think, I think whiskey is on the list. What the Hailstorm does is embrace your base spirit. So get a good one, 
In this case, I'm using a Demerara rum from, uh, I believe this is from the Dominican Republic. Uh, delicious stuff. Um, and perfect for a cocktail like this. You're also going to need, uh, because it's a mint julep, uh, plenty of mint, uh, four sprigs uh, specifically. That's all you'll need for the cocktail, uh, but you'll also need some additional mint for garnishes and uh, some raspberries and, and or edible flowers as well. I could not find edible flowers, so we're just doing raspberries and mint today, but I assure you that's more than enough. Okay, enough chit chat, let's go ahead and make the cocktail. This is a stirred cocktail, so you're going to need uh, a, an appropriate stirring glass. And we need to start by making our julep base, which is a combination of the mint, water, and sugar. Our sugar component is just one tablespoon of super fine, or in this case, demerara sugar. And to sort of help the process of dissolving this along, what I like to do is take my muddler and just crush it while it's at the bottom of the cup with nothing else around it. It's not dissolving, but it is pulverizing it so that it's a little bit easier to stir into the base and then subsequently the rest of the cocktail when it comes time to mix everything together. Now that we've got that started, we can move on to our next step, which is some water. You will need two and a half tablespoons of water for the base, which you can pour directly over the sugar. Now, um, Daddy's instructions actually say to stir and dissolve this now, which I'm going to start the process of, but there's a lot more uh, combining to be done here before the cocktail's ready. So you can actually start the process here and then just leave it partially dissolved as you do the remaining steps. Uh, to make the cocktail. To finish the base, we need to go ahead and throw our mint in there. I've got four really strong sprigs here with a lot of nice big leaves that are looking good and healthy. And you're gonna wanna pick these off and throw them in so we can muddle everything together. Once you have all your leaves in there, go ahead and take your muddler and just press those down gently towards the bottom of the glass. You don't wanna try to shred them up. You're just trying to press them so that the leaves release their oils, but don't tear or rip or fall into small pieces. Now that we have our mint muddled, uh, we have to go ahead and add our base spirit, actually. Um, and a Hailstorm mint julep calls for three ounces of whatever base you've chosen to use. So that's peach brandy, apple brandy, cognac, whiskey, anything I would say aged works well here. Something that has character to it, something that is evolving on the palate. I would go for a Demerara rum personally, or a blend of Demerara and Jamaica rums. In any case, whatever you choose, it's three full ounces. And this is kind of the thing that separates, you know, an, an old school cocktail from a new school cocktail, something classic from something modern. Classic cocktails rectify spirits. They take spirits that are generally considered of poor quality and make them palatable. Modern cocktails use them as the baseline off of which to express other flavors. There's a very clear line, I think, between those two things. So next up, we have to do our preliminary chill. Uh, we're gonna do this by taking a couple of ice cubes and shattering them into our glass so that we can stir our cocktail and begin to chill it so that when we pour it into our cup, we do not melt the ice in the cup too quickly and dilute the drink. Once we have our ice in there, we're gonna go ahead and stir this until it is nice and chilled. And typically that happens, you know, you've got the right amount of dilution and coldness around the time that the ice loosens up. So it becomes easier to stir, it doesn't get caught on the spoon or things like that. It's a little bit easier to maneuver. That's how you know you're about where you wanna be. We are good to go, and when all we have to do is prep our glass, we are off to the races. So with our cocktail base done, we have to, pr to prepare our glass. Um, and really the proper way to serve this would be in a julep cup, which is a specific style of cup, usually made of stainless steel, copper, or pewter, that holds on to cold temperatures really, really well. I unfortunately could not find one on short notice, but I could find a thick walled, hard steel, uh, really a mule mug. And this is equally as good. I think something like along these lines um, or along the lines of a more traditional Moscow mule copper mug would both be effective because at the very least, you're still maintaining the influence that the metal cup has on temperature, which is very crucial here. So to prep the cup, all you have to do is take some ice, and like I mentioned, it has to be like pebble, crushed or shaved ice, something small that you can put a lot of in the glass and dump it in up until just below the rim of the cup. Now that we've got our ice in there, we've got to go ahead and put the cocktail in over it and then dome it up with ice. So we're gonna to top it off a little bit more to uh, make sure we've got full temperature coverage, as it were. Take our drink, put a Hawthorne strainer on there, and I'm gonna double strain it so that I catch any small bits, 
bits of mint that we don't want to be sipping down. Perfect. Once we've got that in there, we've just got to finish topping it up with ice. Now the goal is to create a sort of ice snow cone kind of mound. It's more difficult than it looks, um, but so long as you've got the maximum amount of ice in there so that the drink stays chilled properly, you are good to go. Once that's done, all we have to do is garnish it and we can enjoy our hailstorm juleps. So I'm gonna take some mint here, just give it a quick crush to express the oils, and then stick that into the side like so. And then to give it a little bit of color and as sort of a flavor accoutrement too, I found uh, this works very well. It calls for some seasonal berries, raspberries being very common. We're gonna take a couple of raspberries, spear those on a toothpick like so, and leave those sitting there next to the mint. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the great John Dabney's Hailstorm Mint Juice. Cold and refreshing for your enjoyment. Alrighty, with our station cleaned up, aside from my glass of water that I'm keeping because I could use some water right now, we've got a completed drink. Um, now really, you should be drinking it through um, a metal straw, like a steel or silver straw to help keep that cold temperature intact. But we're doing a lot to maintain that already. And I don't have any, so I'm gonna grab a regular straw and stick that in next to our garnish, which is important because you wanna have your face be exposed to those experiential notes, and we're going to take a nice deep sip. Oh, yes, yes, a thousand times yes. So it's, it's a mint julep. Um, I won't, I won't lie to you and say that it is a familiar enough flavor if you've had other mint juleps, but it's not to the same pedigree. This is leaps and bounds ahead of every other mint julep I've ever had in my entire life. Because a lot of mint juleps nowadays shortcut this process of fresh mint with creme de menthe or mint syrups that taste like skunk. This is everything that that isn't. This is fresh and bright and it wakes you up and it kind of invigorates you. It's, it's, it's something well beyond what you would expect from the phrase mint julep. It's a cold winter storm in a glass but one that you get to experience as a seasoned survivalist. You are out amongst the trees and the fauna in this horrible blizzard and you are loving every second of it. That is what this drink is, at least experientially to me. It's delicious. You get the rum really, really prominently. That's the main majority of the flavor aside from the mint. And that little bit of sugar and the water base is helping to both sweeten and lengthen it slightly. With a lot of rectified spirits, adding a small amount of water is a great way to pull the oils out of it, which helps enhance the flavor and give it some added evolution and how you can experience it in different levels. That's accomplishing this here really well. It's it's just right. It is it is just the the perfect, the perfect, I cannot express this enough, perfect balance amongst all of its components to be exactly what it should be. Bright, light, refreshing, and delicious. Well, now, that we've, now that we've made one of these, um, let's get a little bit real and um, talk about more than just the Cliff Notes version of um, John Dabney's restaurateur life. So John Dabney was an enslaved black man, and there is, in all of the history that's been written about him, a really strong consideration for the fact that that did color his career, his potential, his capability to overcome life's struggles in every way, shape, and form. No matter how successful he got, he was still a black man in Jim Crow and pre-Civil War South, meaning slavery and racism were all around him constantly. And even the same white people who he would become friends with and earn the praises of talked about him quite stereotypically after his death. There's a lot of really great stories that you can tell about John Dabney, and I want to share a couple of them. Um, I don't really know how to order them, honestly, because I think John Dabney is the is a really great example of the human experience from the position of a, you know, a downtrodden minority, um, unjustly so. And... Um, there's really no other way to, to talk about him than to just talk, so. So the first one um, that I want to point out is John Dabney had this incredible reputation of being one of the most honorable people 
in Richmond, if not the entire United States. And a lot of it comes from, first of all, his, his, his primary affect, his sort of just naturally caring and considerate personality. But a lot of it also comes from a story that happens post-Civil War um, between him and his former enslaver. John Dabney's um, enslaver dies after getting married and his wife claims ownership of the Dabney family. During the process of Dabney going out to work for wages for that enslaver, um, rather on the, on the behalf of that slaver, he makes an arrangement to buy his, his freedom from her. Um, because even though he couldn't keep his wages, uh, as was standard for slaves working in the city, um, he could keep tips. And he made, he made solid tips with the work that he did. However, at, in the 1850s, he gets married to another slave by the name of Elizabeth Foster. Um, and not only was her family sort of spiteful of Dabney and Elizabeth um, because of this new juncture and the mounting debts that the family was facing, like unrelated to that, they decide they want to sell Elizabeth Foster off to a different family. Dabney goes to his slave master and says, hey, my wife is about to be sold off to another family. Can I pause the payments I'm making on my own freedom and arrange that I buy hers? Uh, and Dabney's enslaver said yes. So between the work he was doing and the support of not only his enslaver, but a host of white people he had made friends with while working in Richmond, he assembles the, the money and the paperwork and buys his wife out of slavery. The same thing would have happened for him if the Civil War hadn't happened first, because he was actually getting quite close to buying his own freedom away from his enslaver, and then the Union came and did it for him. However, after the Civil War, he hears in, I suppose not necessarily in passing, but somebody tells him that his former enslaver has become destitute because she's not married anymore. She's a widow. She doesn't work herself. She doesn't have any slaves who produce wages for her. Uh, and Dabney no longer made payments to her because he was a free man. He didn't need to buy his freedom any longer. Dabney goes to her anyway and says, hey, can I pay you the remaining sum I owe you for my freedom? And the, the way that a lot of the stories suggest it is that he felt obligated and indebted to her for allowing him to save his wife from being sent away to another family. In fact, the way it's told, his ensl Dabney's enslaver said no. She didn't want the money, but Dabney didn't give her an option. Dabney's son, Wendell, um, writes that essentially how the story went was he walks in, takes a look at the woman, puts a stack of currency on the desk, says, I'm, I'm keep, I think something along the lines of, I'm keeping my word, I will keep my word, and then just walks out without a second guess. And that story ends up getting picked up by a bunch of Richmond newspapers, basically all of them, um, and it pilots him to immediate legend. Um, in the Richmond area. And as amazing as that is, and truthfully, as honorable as that is, and how it can show a sort of sense of strength in the face of like horrible adversity saying, hey, no, we made an arrangement. And even if it was for you to stop enslaving me, I want to hold us to that arrangement. Like that's a really honorable thing. It's a lot more complicated than that. Because when you think about the optics of the situation, the South having been emancipated, sure, no longer had slaves. It didn't make them any less horrendously racist. And as a newly freed black man, even one with a lot of popularity among white people, especially in the city, Dabney needed to make sure he was gonna be safe. He and his family would be able to support themselves. So a little bit of pomp and circumstance that does not only you know allow him to keep his word, which does seem to have been something he was interested in doing no matter the circumstance, but also allows him to really build a name for himself. It was really good marketing. Marketing that he got for free until about 1938, because the story ran from just after the Civil War, like 1963-ish, all the way into 1938. And that's a long time to be mentioned for a single story, especially one like that, even if no one is telling it the way that it is.
It's a fascinating story. Um, and there are a host of others too. Apparently John Davenny bought a house by accident following the Civil War um, when the Union comes to Richmond and essentially takes Richmond from the Confederacy. Um, the Confederates, uh, being the traitorous cowards that they were, burnt the city to the ground, its commercial and industrial districts. And that meant that uh, there was a lot of rebuilding to be done. It, it was attracting a lot of people, and Dabney's apparently just walking down the street one day. He sees people bidding on a house that is still being constructed. And as he's watching, he's sort of nodding at the, at the prices being given. He's like, oh yeah, wow, people, people really want this house. Just kind of passively watching. And when the auction's over, the auctioneer goes, sold the John Tabney. <laughs> He had bought a house by accident, which is something that you would never, you wouldn't think, would be seen in, in in the real world. It's it's crazy. It did happen. It did actually happen. Um, and, and the thing is, when you buy a house accidentally, you might be thinking, "Oh well, shit. How am I going to afford this?" Well, first of all, John Dabney was doing rather well for himself at the time. He had worked in some of the best restaurants in the city, and by this point, had actually opened at least one of the two that he owned. Uh, and that meant that he was he had enough money to cover it, but still required a loan. And because of his honorable nature and stature and how many people knew his name, he had the liquidity and the credit to do so. So yeah, John Dabney bought a house. He bartended his way not only out of slavery, but into both honor and legend, and was so successful, he could afford to buy a house by accident. That's really fucking commendable. So yeah, John Downey bought a house by accident and could afford it because he bartended his way into fame and legend with the help of the Hailstorm Mint Julep. And unfortunately, um, nothing lasts forever and time would present a pretty significant barrier to Dabney's name and fame. So to recap, sort of, John Dabney is born into slavery, is sold off to his former enslaver's wife, wife's brother to work in restaurants, takes up a knack for the work, earns a name for himself, even just as a waiter before becoming a bartender and chef for two of the biggest hotels in Richmond, Virginia prior to the Civil War, which earns him his freedom and in the process, the respect and honor of a lot of people who would otherwise cast him to the side. Really, John Dabney is a legend of Civil War era Richmond and bartenders and mixologists in general. But a lot of people probably don't know his name. You see, Dabney made a name for himself in the time, and like I said, up until 1938 was being written about in Richmond's many newspapers, but it didn't last forever. The four major newspapers in Richmond wrote positive things about his influence on the culture of the culinary life of Richmond, Virginia, but Author W, author and abolitionist, you know, and sociologist, and I think congressman, if I'm not mistaken, W. B. Du Bois, wrote, and I think I should read this verbatim, because it's a powerful quote that I think says it better than I ever could. Abney was an American, a black man, two souls, two thoughts, two unrequited strivings. Two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dog's strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. From the souls of black folk and his sociological principle of Tunis. John Dabney was in this position where he was constantly dealing with the fact that he was a black man in the racist South pre, during, and post Civil War, and having to support himself and his family while doing so and as a result, having to appeal to white sensibility. He was never happy about that, and he was quite verbal with his family members, especially Wendell, who writes a lot about him, um, about John, and says, never tell, uh, something to the, the line of, never tell white folk exactly how much you know about anything other than hard work, and if you do exactly everything that a white person tells you to do, you will end up either at the gallows or in a penitentiary. He was very aware of who he was, and he did what he did to survive and allow his family to be happy. Um, but it kind of came, you know, at the cost of his existence being very much defined by the way that the people around him classified him. And they, no matter how 
talented he was, still saw him as a black man. History revolving around prominent members of African American or even just American culture who are black don't get written about very well. And the same thing happened to John Dabney after a time. Following 1938, nobody wrote much about John Dabney, the exception being uh, a food historian by the name of Robert Moss. Um, and Dabney kind of fell into obscurity, as did the rest of his family. I mean, Elizabeth and John Dabney had five kids who survived into adulthood, one of which was John Milton Dabney. He became a baseball player, and a damn good one at that. Um, Clarence followed John into hospitality work. Wendell went on to go to college, study music, and found the uh, local chapter of the NAACP in Cincinnati, Ohio. And then uh, I believe it's Hattie and Kate, their daughters, became teachers. Very important, prominent, successful, intelligent people who, beyond what I just described to you, have no written history. Their early adult lives is all anyone bothered to write about. And that is definitely because they were black. Historians at the time didn't think it was just to write about them because of their internal racist ideology, thinking that black people didn't deserve to be written about. And as a result, after John and Elizabeth and all of their kids passed, most of them not having any recognizable lineage, as far as I could tell, some of them not having children at all, the Dabney name kind of disappeared. Not completely, though, because Robert Moss still existed. And in 2015, he wrote an article that mentions Dabney's name in passing. Um, a handful of food historians and people who were interested in the subject looked into it, discovered his, his story and his name and the work that he did, the drinks that he made, and eventually his legacy was sort of reawakened. I can't remember their names, but there were a handful of people who were uh, food historians and I think, I think mixologists, bartenders, chefs, things like that, they end up found, uh, founding a dinner in John Dabney's name, um, the first of which I think was held in 2017. Um, and now, just uh, four or so months ago, as of the release of this film, of this video, Dabney & Co., the first black-owned bar in Kalamazoo, Michigan, was opened, and it carries on John Dabney's name and legacy and his signature cocktail to remarkable degrees of accuracy. This whole thing has been about the power and strength of a determined black man to strive against adversity and free himself from the enslavement of the white majority through the art and craft of cooking and namely mixology. And without whom we would not have some amazing stories, culture, and cocktails. That is the life and legacy of John Dabney. If you want to learn more, there's a lot that I, I could not cover in this story. There are some really fascinating, amazing quotes and a lot of historical nuance that's difficult to approach, especially through the optics of me, a white person, telling you about black history. I encourage all of you to stop listening to me and take this as just the primer and then go off and do more reading. In the description down below, in fact, I will link you to as many places as I can find all of the research that I did um, for this video about John Dabney, a lot of which actually came from um, both The Single Sight and Black Mixolence, a cocktail book by Tamika Hall that talks about the influence of the mint julep specifically. Hopefully you guys learned something. Hopefully you guys learned a name and a cocktail and a history that you didn't know before, one that deserved so much to be maintained that it essentially came back from the dead. And now we can continue to thank John Dabney for his work and the delicious things that he makes. If you guys enjoyed this video, go ahead and uh, click that like button down below and subscribe. Um, if you want to learn more about John Dabney, I'm going to link uh, an organization that is presented by um, some Virginia historical societies all about John Dabney and what he did, what his life was like, um, things that he said, etc. I'm also going to link the Dabney & Co. website. Um, I actually reached out to them to see if they would be willing to share um, their version of John Dabney's mint julep. Uh, I, I unfortunately didn't get a response in time. Hopefully they, you know, 
hopefully they're not bothered by that. I didn't expect them to respond. It's not a huge issue. Um, but go check them out because it's the best bar in Kalamazoo. And in fact, I think the best bar that I've ever been to, at the, at the very least, my favorite. Um, and their version of these mint juleps is phenomenal. I like the OG a little bit better, but theirs is through the roof delicious. Thank you all so much for watching. The next episode, we'll be continuing Black History Month by talking about Black mixologist Colin Asair Apia and his influence on modern mixology and his contributions to Tamika Hall's book, Black Mixo... Black Mixolence, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. You guys have a great day. And keep learning. Have a good one.